Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this CMCC webinar uh, on a very interesting topic of the global mapping, mapping of the total semi diurnal internal tide from Argo data. And the speaker is uh, Gaspar Jeffrey, Department of Meteorology of Stockholm University, and I'm Nadia Pinardi from University of Bologna and CMCC. Um, I hope you're numerous. Uh, you will hear very interesting things. But before uh, we leave the floor to Gaspar, who is also um, you know, toward the end of his PhD at Stockholm University, uh, and who has been uh, here also in Italy for some time before going there, um, I would like to introduce you uh, to CMCC. Uh, CMCC is a, a, an Italian organization, um, publicly funded, partially funded, and uh, um, also uh, with joint ventures between different organizations, um, devoted to climate change, uh, and uh, the uh, future uh, society and the future of humankind. Um, the mission is to provide, uh, among other things, uh, um, scientific results uh, that will stimulate uh, sustainable growth and protect the environment and develop uh, adaptation and mitigation policies. So the offices are in uh, six uh, locations uh, in, uh, in Italy. Lecce is the headquarters. And then we have uh, what you see here. And the, the network consists of six uh, universities plus uh, um, a INGV, a national uh, uh, research uh, institute, uh, and um, uh, in addition to also um, resources for the future and uh, the CIRA, the Italian Aerospace Research Center. So uh, the basis of CMCC is interdisciplinary research. Um, we have uh, several divisions that try to break down into workable pieces uh, this interdisciplinary research. So we have advanced scientific computing, impact of agriculture uh, on agriculture forest. We have uh, ocean uh, prediction, regional models, uh, uh, risk assessment, uh, um, platform for science outreach, and so on. Complex. Uh, a scenario that is being now actually changed uh, will be a bit more uh, condensed uh, into three institutes uh, that will have uh, the major aim of CMCC. Uh, our strength is to have dedicated resources of supercomputing. So we have a supercomputing center, which is among uh, uh, the largest in Italy. And uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, teraflops um, uh, of power, several thousand uh, teraflops, uh, uh, cores, uh, 1200 cores, uh, and uh, there is a new system being built, new supercomputing si system. The outreach uh, uh, is an important activity. Uh, so there is a, an office that looks after communication, publication, and also educational tools uh, development. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this is information, and that's it for the time being about CMCC. There is much more, but clearly it's not the time we have to do the seminar. So for the seminar, question and answer session, you have a question and answer session in Zoom, try to find the place. Um, if you want to intervene or ask question, please write in the question and answer section. 
uh, and use also the raise hand feature. Uh, and I will try you to give to try to give you the floor. Uh, the final uh, remarks is that the webinar will be recorded and uh, there is a YouTube channel with the CMC videos, CMCC videos. And uh, please do not forget to follow us on social media. So now I finally leave the floor to our great speaker, um, Gaspar Jeffrey, and um, the floor is yours, Gaspar. Yes, thank you, Nadia, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here from, from Stockholm. Well, it has been snowing for three days continuously now. <laughs> and so let me just share my screen there. All right. So you should be seeing my first slide now. Um, right. So, so the talk I will be giving today is about um, really the main work I've been doing during my PhD here at Stockholm University, where I am working with uh, Jonas Nikander. And the topic of this PhD mainly concerns the observation of internal tides in the ocean. And we have done that mainly using Argo data. So that's what I will be talking about today. Um, now I will be exclusively speaking about the semi-diurnal tides. And these are the tides uh, which have a period of 12 hours. So they happen uh, with highs and lows twice a day. These are the most common on most of the world regions. And I will simply refer to it as the tides or internal tides, uh, but I imply that these are the semi-diurnal ones. So here is the plan for this presentation. I will start by giving you a bit of the context of the problem and why Argo data are important there. Then I will describe a bit more the data itself and then the methods that we use uh, to finally come to our main results, uh, which take the form of uh, a map of the, the energy of these internal tides. Right. So to be a bit nice for those of you who are not particularly familiar with the topic, I figured I might start with this uh, nice video clip that uh, can be found online. So it represents a very simple lab setup uh, with a tank filled with water. And you can see there are two layers there. Uh, the top one uh, is supposed to represent the well-mixed upper ocean sitting on top of the, the blue layer, which is much deeper, and this represents the abyss. So in there, we will generate internal tides, and uh, the two main components there are uh, first the tidal currents. So this is uh, generated by the barotropic tide, meaning that the whole water column is moving back and forth. And when these uh, tidal currents interact with uh, a rough bottom topography, uh, you, you can have generation of these uh, internal waves. So let's see, uh, let me switch to this video clip so you can see it in motion. Right, so it should be moving now. So to generate the tidal currents here, we act on this lever that is on the left of the tank. And you see it makes the tank oscillate uh, to the right and back to the left with uh, a fixed frequency. So this generates tidal currents that go right and back to the left. And when these currents interact with the cement that is right on top of the tank here, uh, you can see the generation of waves that will propagate away from the cement and that can go far away like this. So the waves are mostly visible in the interior and they have a large amplitude there. You can see it at the interface between the two layers. Um, but they also have a very small expression at the surface of the ocean. So it's really hard to see from this clip, but a very small wave is actually propagating back following this large amplitude below. Right. So to give you some orders of magnitude, uh, in the real ocean, such waves could reach uh, hundreds of meter height in the interior, while the expression at the surface is only a few centimeters. So it's like 1,000 times smaller at the surface than in the, in the interior. 
Um, so what we will be doing now is we, with our Argo floats is to come and measure the waves uh, inside the ocean. So right where the amplitude is the biggest. So we will have floats that are adrift at a, a fixed depth. And they will record uh, the having of these isotherms as it passes by, by it. So back to the main presentation. Right. Uh, so just one more thing about, about this uh, lab experiment. So you saw the, the wave propagating. So this carries away uh, the energy that was generated at the seamount. But eventually, these waves will break. And doing so, they will release their energy to the background ocean, and mostly in the form of vertical mixing. And that's something uh, important, as we shall see uh, right now. So it's, it's the main reason why these internal tides are important. Uh, first, it has been a long-standing idea that the internal tides uh, fuel the abyssal overturning circulation. And uh, most recent theoretical findings also point towards the importance of the internal tides uh, in mixing the upper ocean. So with both mechanisms, uh, uh, we, we see that internal tides have a large impact on the ocean state and therefore on the global uh, climate system. Yet, um, it is not quite well understood uh, how they how they will dissipate and where they will dissipate by breaking. So we lack some, some knowledge uh, about some processes occurring on the way during the propagation and the proper dissipation of the waves. And due to that, uh, we, at this time, we don't have a very good parameter parametrization uh, of the mixing that originates from the internal tides to be used in models that do not resolve these fine scales, and in particular in global climate models. So in order to, to get such a, a good parameterization of the mixing that comes from internal tides, uh, one would like to have observations to build a theory on. And we actually have had uh, such observations for, for quite a long time. Uh, and the first source uh, actually comes from satellite altimetry. Now, it is not a straightforward exercise at all to recover the, this internal tide uh, signature at the surface, given that the amplitude is so small. But people have been able to do so, uh, mostly thanks to two things. Uh, the first one is that we have very long records of this altimetry time series, which reach, which reach about 20 years now. And the other important thing to know uh, is the exact frequency and phase of the wave uh, at a given position. So knowing these two things, uh, people are uh, able to reconstruct the wave field uh, as seen by an altimeter, so that is at the surface of the ocean. And here I show an example from uh, such an empirical model. This one is called HRET. And there are um, then a few features that are uh, noticeable here. The first one is that the energy is mostly concentrated or the high amplitude. I, I will switch between energy amplitude and, and variance, uh, but I, I refer to the same thing really. So you, you can see that the energy is mostly concentrated in, in hot spots or, gener or sites with a large uh, generation of internal tides. And is, these are rather well known. So you have one near Hawaii there. You have the French Polynesian Islands there. You also have Madagascar and the Luzon Strait, for instance. And from these hotspots, you can see uh, beams that travel uh, in the ocean. And these can travel for a very long distance, almost basin wide. Right. So one would like to, to use such a map to infer the mixing, uh, so where the, the wave is actually losing energy at the benefit of the ocean. The only issue is that um, this view is incomplete. So you only can see part of the, of the energy of the wave field using altimetry. 
The reason is that as the internal tides propagate in the ocean, they get to interact with uh, the time variable processes that occur there in the background. Uh, for instance, eddies or changes in the, in the stratification that can occur seasonally. So this causes a phase modulation of the internal tides, meaning that they are not remaining in phase with the forcing at the generation. So their, their phase is shifting as they propagate in the heading ocean. In other words, uh, one can say that the internal tides decorrelate as they propagate. And this all means the same thing, the phase changes. So to put it simply, uh, at any given position, one can split the uh, true underlying or the total energy field. So that is this sigma squared dot on the left side of the equation. One can split this total energy into two components. The first one uh, uh, contains all the energy that remains in phase with the forcing. And this is often called the stationary energy. But uh, be careful with this term. It is not stationary in the statistical sense. Uh, really, the meaning of that is that the, this energy corresponds to waves that are in phase with the forcing. And then you have the complementary part, which is then the non-stationary energy, which contains uh, all the waves that have been uh, phase shifted due to interactions with the time variable processes in the ocean. So altimetry provides us with uh, a view of the stationary field of the wave. But really what matters here is the total energy, uh, because this is uh, from, from this total energy that one can infer the mixing that uh, originates from internal tides. So the missing part, the non-stationary, uh, uh, can be evaluated. And some people uh, used actually uh, also altimetry data to do so. But these altimetry data are not properly suited for that. So you have to come with a very elaborated analysis technique to finally be able to estimate this non-stationary energy. So the estimates so far of this non-stationary fraction of the energy uh, gave estimates uh, of between 30% and 50% of the total energy. Meaning that in most of the world region, uh, what was thought uh, uh, before we came out with this Argo records was that the stationary fraction of the energy actually dominates the wave field. So what we will do now is use Argo data to directly measure the total energy wave field. Uh, so this is made possible because the Argo sampling frequency is quite shorter than the altimetry one. Uh, the altimetry has a repeat period of 10 days, and Argo is recording time series with a resolution of one hour. So it sees uh, all the energy that is the in-phase and out-of-phase one. So I, I told you that uh, now that we can record this total energy directly from Argo, then we can also compare it with altimetry, although it is not that straightforward neither. But uh, from, from that point, we actually found that the non-stationary part of the variance is the most important one uh, at the global scale. Uh, we found that this uh, fraction of the variance represents 85% of the total, making the non-stationary internal tides actually dominant in most of the world's region. So to measure this total variance or total energy, we use Argo data. And here I uh, present a sketch of a traditional Argo float cycle. So Argo floats are most well known for this uh, ascending profile during which they record temperature and other physical quantities. But before this ascending profile phase, they have a, a so-called park phase that lasts for about nine days, during which they are adrift at a fixed depth of about 1,000 kilometers. Now, most of the floats uh, don't do anything during this uh, drifting phase or park phase, but some of them, uh, and these are called the iridium Argo floats, do record temperature and pressure as they are adrift. They do so uh, with a hourly resolution. 
So this is this park phase data that we will use uh, to recover the total amplitude of the uh, internal tides. So we primarily use a temperature time series, but really uh, what we will convert it to is the vertical displacement of the isotherms. And this is quite straightforward to get once you have the temperature, temperature time series and the temperature gradient from the neighboring profile, then you can multiply the two to get the, the having of the isotherms that crosses the Argo trajectory as it, as it is drifting. Right. So this is an example time series recovered from Argo Park phase. Uh, since nine days of data is a bit short to run uh, an analysis, we actually stitch together successive park phases and, and then we construct longer time series of 30 days. So this is an example one. Uh, here you have in the x-axis time in hours. So it go up until 720 hours, that is one month. And on the y-axis, you then have the uh, vertical displacement. So this is the having of the isotherms as recorded by the Argo at the constant depth of 1,000 meters. Now, uh, these time series are high-pass filter. So all that is left is the, uh, is the high frequency variability. And you can already see that we have uh, strong oscillations, which happen to be uh, at the semi-journal frequency, so which are likely to be due to the internal tides. Now, this is to give you a sense of the coverage of this Argo data. Of course, uh, new floats are released uh, constantly, so this, this is evolving. And at the time uh, when I produced these figures, then this is what we got. It is slowly evolving though, so might not be very different from today's situation. And here, uh, each black dot represents uh, a segment of 30 days of data uh, from these Argo floats. So we call it a global coverage, although you can see that most of the data actually uh, is in the southern hemisphere. And, uh, and you also can see that some area are widely uh, void from any data. So in particular, see this um, tropical Atlantic part here or in the Northern Pacific as well, uh, we lack some floats. Okay, so we have time series of the vertical displacement and these include um, contributions from a, a wide, uh, wide, say uh, a lot of different processes. And what we want to do is, is always the same uh, problem. We want to isolate the contribution from the semi journal internal tide from all these other uh, noise. Right, so the traditional way to go uh, would be to use spectral analysis. But instead, uh, we found advantageous to use the autocovariance function here. And for two main reasons. Um, so first, it, it gives us a more objective estimate of this total variance. And this is because we don't have that much subjective choices to make in order to get this estimate. And the second important thing with the autocovariance is that it allows us to monitor the decorrelation of the energy uh, up until the stationary limit. So that would be what the satellite sees. So in one plot, uh, using the autocovariance, one can see from the total energy before any decorrelation has happened uh, up until uh, where all the uh, yet to be decorrelated energy has decorrelated. But for today, we will not that much focus on the, the, the this long time lag uh, limit. We will stay focused on this total energy. So for small time lags of the autocovariance. Now, to give you some insights on, on how we use the autocovariance to uh, solve this problem, uh, let's start by defining the autocovariance function. So for a stationary process in the statistical sense this time, uh, let's call this process H of T, then the autocovariance is simply defined as the time average of this process uh, multiplied by itself, but time lagged by a time lag two. And now, if you set tau to zero, 
uh, you do recover the definition of the variance. So the autocovariance at time lag is zero gives you the variance of the process H. Now let's apply that on a very simple example. So this process H is now uh, a simple tidal vi variability with a constant amplitude, uh, capital A, a constant frequency, omega, uh, which we can take to be the semi-journal one, and no phase at all. Okay, so computing the autocovariance from H of T, uh, we get this result here. So the uh, autocovariance looks like uh, a cosine at the same frequency, but now with an amplitude of A squared over two. And if you set the time lag to zero, then you recover the variance of the process that is A squared over two. Now let's complicate things a bit and add this uh, phase modulation uh, in, in this model. So I do so by adding a random process that is phi of t inside the cosine here. And this phi is defined as uh, an autoregressive process. And here I plot uh, in red this new model, excuse me, that is the, the phase shifting cosine compared with the black one, which is the, the cosine with a fixed phase. So you can see, as time go, uh, you can see the phase shifting more and more. Now let's compute the autocovariance from this new model. And you see that the result is actually quite close to what we got before. The only difference is this term uh, that is a decaying exponential. So what we get instead of a constant amplitude cosine at the semi dormant frequency, we get an exponentially damped cosine uh, with the amplitude decaying with time lag. Right? So that's the red curve. And again, uh, what we are interested in is the um, limit of this autocovariance uh, when tau reaches zero. So for tau is zero, uh, you can look at the plot and um, see that the red curve and the black curve are, actu are actually equal. So we do recover the total variance of uh, this tidal variability. You can also look into the equation above. If, you, if I set tau to zero here, this exponential term goes to one so that I recover again this variance A squared over two. The other limit then would be for very large time lag. And you see that uh, as we go, the amplitude of the autocovariance decays. So more and more energy is shifted out of phase by the process phi. And we finally asymptote to the stationary, stationary limit. So that would be what the altimetry actually sees. And again, from the equation, uh, if I set tau going to infinity there, then the autocovariance of the phi process will go to zero because phi is some random noise. And then I'm left with uh, the value of the stationary uh, internal tide there. So that would be a squared over two times the exponential of minus the variance of phi. So that was uh, still a simple case where I only consider a tidal variability. Uh, now let's look to a model that is uh, way closer to the reality uh, and actually quite close to it. So now I include uh, a stochastic noise on top of that, that represents uh, the background noise in the ocean. Now remember that uh, the time series we used were high past filtered. So all that is left is some high frequency noise all the low frequency part of the spectrum has been already uh, taken care of. So I add this background stochastic noise, uh, small r, and I consider different uh, tidal variabilities here. So I have a sum of uh, tidal variabilities where I uh, um, represents the constituent uh, that I consider. So I can be uh, M2 for the moon semidermal uh, main component. And each time I will have a different frequency, phase modulation, and amplitude. Now, if you compute the autocovariance of this model, uh, the result is again fairly simple because it's only the superposition of the autocovariances of uh, all these parts. So you get the autocovariance of the noise here 
added to the autocovariance of each individual tidal variability there. And these have the same form as before. Okay, so now if I plot that, uh, this is what you see here, the black line. So it can look messy at first, but it's, it's actually uh, quite easy to read when you get used to it, uh, perhaps. So the, the main point here, uh, because remember what we want to get is the uh, variance associated with the semi-journal internal tide only. The main point that is quite useful to us is that the random noise will actually decorrelate uh, much quicker than the uh, internal tide. So just after a few hours of time lag, the contribution from this autocovariance of the random noise will go to zero. So that we are left only with this sum of uh, sinusoids. Okay, so I cannot use uh, the covariance value at zero, that is the variance, since this, this is contaminated by the noise and all the other deterministic processes that might be there. But what I can do is, is use the first few oscillation of this autocovariance to try to recover uh, the total variance of the internal tide. So to separate the semi donal variability from the others, uh, what we do in practice is to fit a cosine at the semi journal frequency using least squares. And we fit this cosine in a window of 48 hours of time lag. So this is the red dashed uh, cosine that you see on this plot. Uh, so fitting this by these squares will give us uh, the, an estimate for the total amplitude of the internal tide. Now there is one uh, minor complication on top of that. Uh, since we are using finite length time series, then we, we will have um, sampling errors that will affect um, our records. And these are actually quite large. And in order to mitigate this, the workaround we found is to average multiple uh, autocovariance locally. So now, how do we actually build the global map? Uh, as I just said, uh, what we need to do in order to get uh, exploitable records is to average uh, different sample autocovariance because the sampling errors are just too large if I was to use only one 30 day long time series. So what we do is construct um, patches in which we bin the Argo segments of data and these take the form of uh, circles with a radius of 200 kilometers. And all segments of data that falls into a bin is or a patch, uh, then is attached to it. Then for all these segments of data, we compute the uh, individual autocovariance and we average the result to get a local mean autocovariance, uh, which has a much smaller uh, errors than the individual autocovariance series. And from this local mean autocovariance, then uh, what we have to do is then fit this cosine at the semi donal frequency in the first 48 hours of time lag, giving us the estimate for the total variance of the semi journal internal tide. And we call that uh, this least square fitting, we call it demodulate. Yeah. So now to the result. Um, so you can see two maps there. The top one represents this semi-general internal tide energy recorded by Argo floats at 1000 meters. And the bottom one is the corresponding error that can be also estimated from this local mean autocovariance in each bins. So the picture you see, uh, maybe you don't remember, but it's, it's actually quite similar to what we saw with altimetry. So we still have these hotspots uh, here in Hawaii on the French Polynesian. We have these hotspots with large energy and the energy decays as I move away. So as the beams are propagating away from the generation sites, you can see the energy decaying. Now the main difference uh, with the altimetry field is that this is uh, not affected by the decorrelation that I was speaking about. So this is the total energy that one can use to directly um, uh, infer the mixing uh, that comes from internal tides. 
No, it is not that straightforward, but still uh, it is doable. Uh, we can compare these Argo records at 1,000 meters with what has been recorded by altimetry at the surface. And to do so, uh, we simply put, we, we project the um, sea surface amplitude down at the uh, parking depth of Argo, so down at 1,000 meters. And we do so using vertical mode decomposition. So here on the top panel, I show the stationary uh, variance that is given by altimetry uh, projected at 1,000 meter. And on the bottom panel, then, uh, it is the ratio of the stationary energy uh, over the total energy that is recorded by Argo. So this bottom panel shows you the stationary fraction of the energy. So how much of the total energy uh, actually is stationary. And you can see that uh, this peaks at about 0.6, and it is mostly, uh, I mean, in most of the world regions, it is uh, quite small. You can see a lot of deep blue everywhere, meaning that this stationary fraction is actually quite small. So in other words, that the non-stationary fraction is actually uh, very important in, in all these places. So that's <clears throat> it for today. The data that I just shown uh, is published and accessible, so uh, everyone can use it. The codes that are used to produce these maps are also available. And of course, I remain available if uh, anyone has any questions about this and wants to, to use this. Uh, here are the references that I used to prepare this presentation. And uh, I only have to thank you for your attention and, uh, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gaspar. Very <clears throat> important presentation. So let me see if we have questions, uh, maybe in the question and answer. Or you can actually put your hand up. Question and answer, I have one. Yes. Okay, so we have the first. Thank you for your very impressive presentation. I agree. <laughs> you say that you are using vertical mode decomposition in projection of uh, HREP, uh, I mean, the stationary uh, components, surface amplitude to 1000 meters. What mm -hmm. file are you using for this? Oh, this is a good question. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, so um, actually, as, as I said, it's, it's, it's not straightforward to compare these two fields. Um, so properly to compute these vertical modes, uh, I used uh, Argo profiles. Uh, so in each bins, I, I, uh, I do compute it from the Argo profiles. Um, yet one has to, to consider the, the entire uh, water column. And these Argo profiles only come from 2,000 meters uh, up to the surface. So I, I have to extend these by, uh, I think what I do is repeating the last uh, measurements. So that is the one at 2,000 meters and put it at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and I take this depth from uh, uh, any bathymetry source. I, I use JEPCO in, the, in this case. Um, Right, but then, yeah, um, also to do to do so, uh, one has to know that uh, this HRED product comes in a version where it is decomposed into uh, mode contributions. Are so they I, empirical orthogonal modes or are we talking about dynamical modes? Uh, so the one arising from this uh, charm um problem, so I, I don't really know. How the which one, problems. sorry, which problem? This charm equation. I think so, it is dynamical modes. Right. That's, that's it's great. not empirical because otherwise you would have to solve for a, an eigenvalue. Uh, yeah, amplitude. right. Yeah, different. So, so. No, I get you. Yeah. So it is the theoretical ones using the this equation. And why did you use them instead of the empirical orthogonal functions that we use in data simulation? Um, that's actually a good, uh, good lead. Uh, I, I, I didn't try using empirical modes at all, but uh, it could be worth having a look at it, true. 
but to to be fair i i feel that this comparison is just uh, rough because um what what one point that i didn't spoke about is is also that argo actually records contributions from all modes at only one depth so you cannot really know uh, which mode is contributing to this um, total variance that you record um, one one view is to say that it is mostly the, the first mode that contributes to it because you are quite close to the maximum of the first mode in uh, i mean in the global average but uh, it can be that you have uh, higher modes that have uh, large contributions as well thank you <clears throat> are there other questions okay i have one myself uh, i have several but <clears throat> so your um, i mean what will be a method that will use your um, tools to um, eliminate the internal waves from Argo, from the Argo profile. Can I do that? Because, you know, when we assimilate, for example, uh, we are assimilating, we, we don't have internal wave field in our models. We assimilate Argo that has internal wave field and uh, so we try to bring our thermocline, which uh, is uh, being displaced by internal waves to a position mm. that should be there only for 12 hours or less than that. So how do I, have you thought about filter, a uh, filter of internal waves for your Argo? So, um, so, so all this is not happening in the time domain, really. So I, I think this is quite far from, uh, from this application. The, the nearest application I see is, is to use these values to constrain models. So uh, models that can in turn be used to predict the, these non-stationary internal tides. But you are, yeah, then you are, you are pretty much right. So the, only predicted field that we have uh, actually comes from altimetry. So you do miss a large fraction of this uh, displacement if you if you only rely on that. Uh, but then, yeah, I think that the best option would be to use uh, very high resolution models that have been tested against this data and, and use these predictions. And, and actually, I, I just uh, sent a paper on, on validating such high resolution model and it is um, in discussion in ocean sciences, if you're interested uh, and want, want to check that. I have another question, but I want to finish, if I may, <clears throat> uh, my question. So uh, how many levels has your model? Um, so you mean for this new paper? For the paper, yes, for the new paper. Uh, so it is ICOM, uh, which has, uh, it's, it's the highest, uh, highest definition of the of version of it. It has 41 vertical layers and uh, 1 25th of a degree in horizontal. Okay. And um, right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, sorry, Simon, I, I let the Fernand uh, to, to ask, and then I go back to Simon, who was the first one to ask. So um what criteria have you defined for filtering eliminating argo profiles i miss that part um quality control of argo yes so so let's phrase it like this um so the quality control mainly so for the profiles there are not much actually uh, the the biggest part of the data that i discarded mm -hmm. Uh, is because of the park phase data that was not uh, that that good. So mainly the data I discard is where the the valid data from the park phase. Um, well, let me think about the criteria I used. I guess the the most important one is that the um, the speed of the floats uh, has to be lower than. 0.1 meters per second on average 
over one month. So this discards uh, regions where the uh, mesoscale activity is large. So that would be an important criterion. And uh, then there are other ones that really concerns the, the like we, we also check the pressure recalls to check that the floats is not deviating from this 1000 meter uh, park level. Uh, and we discard floats that do uh, either go uh, like uh, a few times too far away or that are, are drifting away from this mean uh, parking depth. Um, then, yeah, I guess if you want more details, it might be best to go check the, the paper that is um, in JGR, actually. Um, but that's what I can tell you at that point. So here is another question. Can you recover the phase lag, so the direction of propagation of the internal tides from the multiple <laughs> autocovariance? in your 200 kilometer radius. I remember the 200 kilometer. Is it 200 kilometer? Yeah, it is precisely. And okay. that's, um, that's another good question. Thank you. Um, and um, I've been thinking about it. And, and actually, it, um, uh, I didn't find any uh, question to that, uh, answer to that question. Um, there might be a way, but, uh, but um, yeah, this time I, I didn't find a way to, to do it. But in, yeah. So, so one has also to consider that, um, so you have these floats moving all around in different direction, and you have also waves that do not come from only one source, but can come from different direction at the same time. So you have this interference pattern, and you have the, the floats that are uh, traveling across that. So you have a lot of, uh, different effects that, that take place. And then it, it quite complicates this, uh, this matter in particular. So let me see if there are other questions. So how about, um, do you think you could find that the, something about the interaction of internal waves with the mesoscale field? Right, that's that's also a very good question. Thank you. Um, that, that yeah, that actually would be very interested in, interesting to look at. Uh, of course, to do so, uh, then I would have to uh, to not filter the data prior to run the analysis. Actually, I I've done so um, and uh, tried to understand what was happening there, and um, I, I didn't, but. I think there are informations about the mesoscale flow uh, that is also uh, laying in this uh, algo data and, and which uh, could be very useful in, in particular to study the, the wave and balance flow interactions. Okay. Okay, so let me see if there are more. Um, yeah, Simon says, uh, yes, I agree, thank you. So this is referred to the um, uh, directional propagation investigation, I guess. So um, is there, are there more questions to Gaspar? If not, then I think we could conclude and thank again uh, Gaspar for being available and give us such an interesting talk. Thank Where you for having me. Yeah, somebody is talking. Hello? Yeah. Oh, maybe it was me. Yeah, Thank okay. you for having me. I, said. <laughs> I know I have something more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there is another question here, but I think that you can maybe uh, get in touch, uh, Simon, with uh, Gaspar. Uh, you now know his address and everything, and maybe it's good to, you know, it is again a question of the paraclinic modes. You went into, you know, the real issue in oceanography, <laughs> how to extrapolate <laughs> uh, surface altimetry. This is what we do every day, and uh, what we all the time suspect 
of not doing very well. Mm. Okay, so thank you so much, Gaspar, again, uh, and uh, really looking forward to your final part of the dissertation. So maybe we will invite you in a year or so again. I would be glad to be back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you all for being with us. Thank you. Bye.